He wears the bandages on his face for a month. Apparently never looks at his face in between. He's not He's not refreshing his dressing. He's just wearing the same gross, nasty bandage. He's going to have like all sorts of like acne. <laughs> Finally pulls that off. The, like serious infection is gonna be like brown. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> it's like no wonder it screwed up your face. You never changed the bandage. Most versions of Too Faced should probably be dead from infection. Welcome to Bat Lessons, the Batman History Podcast. I'm Brian, and I'm Alex. And on this episode, we're talking all about the Duke of Duplicity. Two-Face. And to help us do that, we're joined by a very special guest, Jameson from A Comic Book A Day. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hopefully I remember anything about this bat character you're speaking of. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, you, are you excited to talk about Two-Face with us? Actually, this is, I think, one of the better issues up to now of, of up to <laughs> where we are in the Golden Age. When we're talking about Batman. So, yeah, I'm more excited about talking about this than I would say, like, the next issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for <laughs> sure. It, it, the, we, we have ridden the roller coaster, the ups and downs, and there's been a lot of downs so far. The three, <laughs> the yes. three daredevils. Um, I, I, so we haven't been doing every single issue where what's. Okay. Uh, oh, OK. I, you enlighten us about the three devil devils. Okay. I don't remember which one that is, but it's like three circus. They're all like Dick grown up Dick Grayson's and they're committing crimes. <laughs> Well, so I have to ask, do you, do you have a favorite Two-Face story? It has to be Long Halloween. It is it is the quintessential Two-Face origin. Mm -hmm. There actually is a really good Two-Face moment in the issue I don't like that's coming up. Oh, yeah? What happens? Um, it feels like there's eight different stories in that one. And in one of them, he decides to go back to his fiance, who we'll meet in the issue we're talking about today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he pretends he has the plastic surgery, but he he's oh, only yeah. put <laughs> wax over his, the side of his face. And there's a and candle. They're having, yeah, they're having dinner and there's a candle. And it's a really yeah. good panel of like a horror comic with his face melting on the half. And that's such a strong image that I wish his face was constantly melting. <laughs> <laughs> that is certainly that's one good. of the Batman moments of all time. <laughs> yeah, that is for for Golden Age art. Really good. Sure. So before we jump into the first appearance of Two-Face, Detective mm -hmm. 66, I wanted to talk briefly about George Roussos. This is an artist that we have not yet spoken about because it's kind of hard to know when he joins the Batman team. He is an inker that joins the Bob Kane studio in 1940. So that's two years right. before where we are. But the thing is, is that at first he's inking other stuff because Bob Kane is still doing other stories, other strips for Detective Comics and for other books at National. And if you go by like the omnibus, right, where they have credits mm -hmm. and things, or you go by DC Universe Infinite, George Russo is not listed under all of these issues. Like if you go back to some of the previous episodes we've done, the first uh, Penguin, the first Clayface, he's not there. But there are many, many interviews where Jerry Robinson is on the record saying that this is the time frame where he's inking things. And not only inking things, he's doing a lot of the backgrounds. So Jerry Robinson is going through doing character work, doing all the figures, and handing it off to George Rousseau, who is penciling backgrounds, so buildings, rooms, things like that, and then inking the whole thing. Um, so it's a very collaborative art process, much more than an inker today would do. Right. So... So really quickly, can you uh, describe what an inker does? Are, are they just sure. the person who goes over the pencils with the final? Funny enough, in what was it? The classic Kevin Smith movie, uh, Chasing Amy. He keeps yeah. getting complained about that. He's just a tracer. But it does. It, it is a very <laughs> hard art form to try to try to get across why it's so important. It can really change the look of the art depending on what they're going with. Yeah, so uh, what what basically they're doing, right, is tracing <laughs> over the pencil work. But also, mm -hmm. when you have pencil works, a lot of times they could be sketchy. So, like, you might have, right. like, the line of a shoulder that could be drawn three or four times. And the inker's choosing the one that is the correct one, basically, right? It's like, you're not erasing lines per se, but it's like... Mm -hmm you're you're choosing the one right you're yeah. you're sort of and in some cases they make artistic choices where they might change the art from the penciler and the reason that you would do that right because if you think about it like if, if you're you know an artist professionally 
Mm-hmm. Would you really want someone else to come in afterwards and choose which line is the most significant one or like make it less sketchy or whatever? The reason you're doing that is to par- parallelize the work, right? To make it go mm-hmm. faster. And also it has the sort of added side benefit of for the business side where they feel a little bit more like the artist is having less ownership, to be frank. Like there's a little bit of divorce from, you Love know. that. Yeah. <laughs> this is not yours. <laughs> this is the company's, right? There's not... Too much to say about George Rousseau broadly, other than he was in the industry for a long time. So um, he was born in 1915. He joins Bob Kane's studio in 1940. Um, he died in 2000. And by various mm. accounts, he was still working at Marvel around the time of his death. It was either sometime in the mid 90s when he stopped. Some people say he was still working for Marvel as late as 2000. Um, wow. He did, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. For sure. So very... he worked from like 25 to what, 85? Is that 85, that yeah. Jeez. Something like that. I love this industry, but with all creative art forms, we really do terrible things to to the creatives yes. that they have to be. Sure, working. sure, sure, sure. The idea that like that someone long. would be at that age and, and not be able to afford to retire is is right. fairly sad. I will say though, like uh, the the sort of like market that he left on the industry is pretty incredible. If you look at like the people that he's you know inked before, like you know Jack Kirby and like he, you know um, John Romita and um, all, all those sorts of people, and you know Jerry Robinson, um, it's a it's a pretty incredible um, career. And by the end, was was doing coloring work, was doing digital colors on on covers for Marvel, right? Like it's, it's okay. Pretty, that's that's really impressive because then he would have had to learn the computer yeah, skill. Yeah, exactly. Which a lot of like old artists in animation refuse to do. And you lost yeah. like a generation really instantly. Right. The reason I decided to bring him up on this episode is just because I thought the backgrounds were really good. And, you know, he was on my list to talk on, you know, during the golden age here. So as as we go through, just try to keep an eye for like some of the buildings or some of the rooms and things. Cool. And because of Bob Kane, it's so hard to know who did what on Batman. It's true, yeah. Because crazy egomaniac. Have you talked about his uh, grave marker? <laughs> we did not talk about the gravestone. Oh, jeez. Are you sure? Jeez. We definitely jeez. talked about the plagiarism and, and oh, yeah. the, all oh, the yeah. Bill Finger stuff. Okay. Oh, you, you I've, can't. I've seen his grave marker, but... Uh, yeah, I think it, was yeah in... and it really gets across how what his ego was. Yeah. And then there's so many side stories about him... If you've ever heard the one about the uh, clown paintings? I did, yeah. Some of yeah. those were in, I don't think the clown paintings were in uh, Batman and Bill, the documentary. But we no. did, on episode um, three, we did have Mark Tyler Nobleman on the show. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's, and, that's a great kit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had a lot of great conversations about Bill Finger and, and, and yeah. Bob. I really like that documentary for, because we all kind of believe the story of Bob Kane making that deal after screwing over uh, the Superman creators. Oh, sure, sure. To get that his, he wasn't 18 when he signed the contract. He was, of course. <laughs> and that they had signed like in perpetuity of of him being the sole creator. And when you watch that documentary, there's the the uh, lawyer friend, the copyright lawyer friend to, uh, to Finger's granddaughter is getting very close to saying, there is no way this is true. The legality of that is like impossible, but we all kind of believed it. But if you think about it logically, like there's no way that would hold up in court. Brian, I heard you whistle a second ago. Oh, we have uh, we have never talked about this gravestone. You're just looking at I'm, the gravestone. I'm for the looking first time. at it, and it's like holy oh, it's, smokes. Oh, it is fantastic to explain uh, the ego of Bob Kane. Yeah, I mean, just like op- opening paragraph <laughs> on his uh, gravestone is God bestowed a yeah. dream upon Bob Kane. Blessed with divine inspiration and a rich imagination, Bomb created a legacy known as Batman. It's like, holy smokes. Like, I have no, I've never seen anything like this before. You might have mentioned this before. Jerry Robinson would say that there was more Bill in Batman than there ever was Bob. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Hey, y'all, cutting in very briefly to let you know that uh, there was a few technical difficulties from uh, this point in the show forward. Brian's laptop battery died. Uh, Jameson's internet cut out a few times. So there's some low frame rates, some awkward transitions. Um, still think it's a great uh, conversation. Uh, hope you enjoy it. Okay. On that, I think we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about Detective Number 66. Ooh, ooh, Batman, Batman, Batman. 
So we open up on the title page, and uh, the subtlety is not uh, Jerry Robinson, Bob Kane, and Bill Finger Finger's friend. <laughs> 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 we have what looks like in, you know, um, maybe a castle. There's stone walls behind, and, you know, a large old wooden uh, chair. You could maybe even describe it as a throne. It comes way up above his head. We have Two Face sitting there in his suit, which is purple on one side, orange on the other. He's um, sort of doing the Dracula where he's like holding up the, the I don't know, the collar of his suit jacket, mm -hmm. hiding the half of his face. And he's holding in front of him a copy of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, by Robert Louis Stevenson. It's I feel yeah. like they're spoiling it for us. They knew that Bat Lessons, we were going to talk inspirations after the fact. Right here on the nose, they're letting us know this guy, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Yeah, it even says it in the in the forward that the little blurb. Yes, that I I, I thought it, it says it multiple times in the issue, but it says meet the most bizarre criminal of all time, a 20th century Jekyll Hyde in the crimes of Two Face. Yes, um, they they really uh, play up the the coin as well in that beginning blurb. You know, have you ever mm -hmm. tossed a coin right. to decide something? Subtle yeah. problem about which you couldn't make up your mind? Remember how eagerly you watched to see which side won? Heads or tails? It's very uh, Bill Finger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shades of Batman uh, 66 as well. So one one little thing I did notice, because we've talked about the covers quite a bit, is yeah. that uh, Robin is based on Robin Hood. Right. And that's... And, in previous issues, the font was oh, much true. more old English oh. uh, to, to be stylized like uh, Robin Hood. And this one, it's much more comic booky. It's It's lost its old English um, font, font type. Yeah, I think that's a first for us for sure. Though I find it fascinating that we're hiding Two-Face's face, but the cover is basically the same idea of the Robert Louis Stevenson uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's almost yeah, the exact same design, too. so it doesn't... It's a spoiler without really wanting to spoil anything? It's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. I actually kind of enjoyed the fact that we save the reveal of his face um, in the book until a specific moment. It, that felt really impactful for me. But yeah, you're right. It's right there on, on the uh, title page. Uh, we've, got, we've got Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde doing the split face as well. And we didn't really... like Because I, I mainly do Superman stuff. It took 20 to 50 issues for like these title pages to really start coming about. And most yeah. of the time they don't quite lead into the story with the image. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. They get better with that over time. And that's going back to my earlier point that they've kind of figured out what to do here. Yeah. The, no, th th this at least has the characters, <laughs> you know, uh, all together. They're, it doesn't to me. This doesn't feel like an event that I would expect to happen in the story. When we did Penguin uh, last month, uh, mm -hmm. there's a moment where you know Penguin's like actually pulling off a crime, like he's holding up a, a, yes. a couple, and that's something that you you might expect to happen, right? Like he's seeing a crime right. occur in the book that um, definitely did not. In in Superman, he'll generally at, at the beginning he'd be like saving some sort of like crash or disaster happening, and then it would be absolutely none of that. And I think once, because because sometimes I don't pay attention to this really well because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it's just the prologue. There was at least one where it was 100% important, like what was happening in the description and the image was actually the start of the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I am I'm kind of curious as we read through if he's actually, if Two-Face ever shows up in this situation. No. Uh -uh, I, I, I don't remember that ever happening. No, but uh -uh. He, he looks like he's in like the dungeon of a castle yeah. uh, at this like b massive chair with a there's like the the feather quill. There's he's reading by candlelight. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that that I was pretty confident that didn't happen. But I want to check because that's that's a really common uh, trope in these Golden Age uh, comics is the cover never actually shows up in the story. So we open up. We're on the steps of the courthouse. We're introduced to Harvey Kent. As you pointed out, this is not Harvey Dent yet. His name changes later, right? Yes. It's still in the Golden Age, but... Kent is kind of an oddly popular name in DC. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you, yeah. of course, have Clark Kent, but then you would have Dr. Fate, Kent Nelson. No, that's what a lot of people have speculated, is that they, they change away from Kent to Dent because the popularity of the name. You've got Clark mm -hmm. Kent, uh, Superman. He's walking up the steps of the courthouse. Everyone's saying he's very good looking. They call him Apollo. And we cut to inside the courthouse. Uh, we're in situation. It's in the middle of a trial. Harvey calls to the stand. His first witness, Batman. He says, we had a fight and Maroney got away. 
but he's the man who shot Bookie Benson. And he points at uh, Maroney. And I, I think that's really interesting. This is the Maroney from Batman Begins this is where this the name comes from. You know, Maroney goes, he's lying. He's lying. Harvey Kent has the two sided coin or the double sided double headed coin. Uh, it's a silver dollar. And he says, it's, yeah, it's Maroney's funny enough. It's yeah. Yes. We found it at the scene of the crime. It's got your fingerprints on it. And Maroney realizing that he's he's been caught says, uh, you know, OK, I'm going to fix you. And he lunges at Kent and Batman realizes this is going to happen, jumps up in the middle, goes for a punch and Maroney is throwing acid at at Harvey Kent and it, it gets on his face. So here we have the, the origin of of Two-Face. It, it's it is the origin of Two Face. It's yes. it's what stays yeah. for the most part. You have Maroney. He doesn't have like a weird name like Bookie Benson, which yeah. is a very <laughs> popular way of naming uh, the alliteration. The, yeah, not just the alliteration, but just even like a silly or nickname. You would have mm-hmm. so much because they had to like create a mobster almost every issue because mm-hmm. that was like the main thing everybody's dealing with. Superman's dealing with them. They don't cause much of a threat to him, but he's dealing mm-hmm. with them. And he, and you have to have like a new one every week. But it's Sal. Uh, Sal stays on. And even like I wouldn't have expected it to be this consistent. Yeah, he comes wholly, fully formed. The same was true of, of Clayface. He's basically nothing like the Clayface we know today. He's not the, the monster. Yes, that's right. right. Like he's just a dude that puts on makeup. Uh, Two Face here. It's basically we get him. He's exactly right. He has the same origin, uh, the same motivations, the same shtick, uh, and and it's not even to this issue. It's like the first like four panels of this issue. We haven't even gotten yeah. past the second page. The only I don't know if you read the the new Fifty Two Batman and Robin that had a different origin of Two Face. That's the Peter J. Tomasi stuff. Yes, it was. It was yeah. two twin sisters. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think named McKinley. I think killed his wife and scarred his face, but it was completely different. And of course, death metal has restored all continuity, so that sure, doesn't sure. matter anymore. Uh, Brian, were you going to say something? Oh, uh, which side of the face did this acid hit? That's a good question. In the in the in the picture. Um, where the acid is splashing, it looks like it's hitting the left side of his face, but I believe the rest of the book, it will be on his right. Yeah, I think I think you got your your directions back to or messed up, Alex. So when you're facing him, yes, the acid is on the mm. left, but it's his mm. right his side. His right, yes, correct. His right. But then, yeah, just same page, uh, three panels later, he's looking in a mirror and the right side of his face looks fine. Right. Which in the whole rest of the issue, it's the left side. And I think throughout all of history, it's the left side that is. Um, Sorry. Uh, the, scarred. the left when he's his his left. His left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His, his left. Yeah. I mean, I, I forget what Golden Age artist admitted that he could never remember what finger what what's what hand the Green Lantern ring went on, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, which I believe was. Was it the left or right when it was Alan Scott? They flipped it when when it became the Hal Jordan Green Lantern, but they sure. could never remember. They're being paid horribly. They're probably working in a <laughs> sweat box. Um, they don't. True. They're they're changing in and out. They barely know what's happening. It's just like, yeah, you draw draw this. He kind of looks like that. Uh, <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, pandemonium breaks loose. Uh, a doctor hurries, hurries to the stricken DA. They wrap his face in bandages and he wears the bandages on his face for a month. Apparently never looks at his face in between. He's not, he's not refreshing his dressing. He's just wearing the same gross, nasty bandage. He's going to have like all sorts of like acne when he <laughs> finally pulls that off. Like serious infection. It's going to be like brown. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> two face like, no should. wonder it screwed up your face. You never changed the bandage. <laughs> Most versions of Two Face should probably be dead from infection. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Especially the Dark Knight one. Oh, yes. yeah. Absolutely no. agree. It's just an open wound, like actively yeah. the whole time. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> that's just like a blood loss problem. Uh, so they remove the bandage for the first time. He sees his face. We don't, though, right? Th- that's why we were just saying mm-hmm. it's from behind we're seeing. He says, My face, mm-hmm. the acid has left one side scarred and the other hideous. And there's a really interesting uh, line that I guess they they feel like they have to come up with an excuse because the the reader's going to think this. And the doctor says, oh, I know you're thinking about plastic surgery already. 
Uh, but, you know, there's no way. No doctor could possibly do it. And, and Batman says, ah, but I know, you know, uh, a, one, someone that can perform that miracle, Dr. Eckhart, the European specialist, which I, I, it's so it's so weird that they introduce this problem. Batman undercuts it. And then literally the next panel, we turn the page and we're in the home of Dr. Eckhart speaking to like his mother, maybe, or his wife. I'm not sure. Um, and she's saying, oh, Dr. Eckhart, he went to visit his brother in Germany uh, long ago. The war started and the Nazis put him in a concentration camp. So we introduce a problem in one panel. We undercut it in the next. And then the third, we uh, undercut it again. We reintroduce the problem. Uh, and, and the problem is, is, you know, just really grim uh world war ii mm -hmm. uh concentration camp it's not only really grim batman doesn't seem to care and and, and of mm -hmm. course it's hard to deal with these ideas going on at the same time of 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 with superheroes who can essentially end this but it is weird sure. that batman goes oh there's a guy in a concentration camp i guess he's fine there it's true yeah uh, so uh, another kind of interesting uh, I don't know, maybe not a synchronicity, but like a, a serendipity. Um, this Dr. Eckhart, mm -hmm. what's uh, what's the name of the actor who plays Two Face in The Dark Knight? Aaron Eckhart. Oh, <laughs> also, that's funny. That's not where my mind went. In a weirder reference, um, in Batman '89, the corrupt cop that Jack Nicholson shoots. Uh -huh. Early on, played by William Hootkins, who of course played uh, Jack Porkins in Star Wars, is named Eckhart. No kidding, really? Yeah, yeah. That is, his name is Eckhart. He, he has that line where oh, I can't remember the line very well right now, but he's like, "Hey, Eckhart," says it, shoots him. There you go. Huh. That's kind of wow. crazy. That is crazy. Also, we didn't bring this up. But he's already wearing an outfit that's two yes. colors on the side. Did it's he true. have yes. this outfit prepared? <laughs> I don't know. He's wearing it when, when they start to take off the bandages. Yeah. Yes. Maybe we're supposed to assume the acid changed the color of the suit? He's been and wearing he didn't it for, change month. It for yeah. a month? <laughs> didn't take off the bandages. Just, just wore the suit. It's the whole left side of his body is scarred <laughs> be because of the, oh, this is crazy. I choose to believe that he had it tailored because uh, he knew that there was going to be a difference between the two sides of his face and he thought he was going <laughs> to play it off. So, a, always a good start. I choose to believe <laughs> dot dot dot. But yeah, so he, he goes home and uh, there's people on the street are just saying kind of cruel and horrible things like, oh my God, he's horrible looking. And this child says... Uh, mommy, that man frightens me. And the mom is like, now, darling, we, uh, he won't hurt you. He won't hurt you. And then th thinks to herself, a face like that would frighten me too. <laughs> we, through this whole time, we don't get to see his face still. It's, uh, he's uh, turned to the side. We're seeing him in profile, his face away from the camera. He mm -hmm. goes through the front door. He, um, presents himself to his fiance Gilda, and she says, Harvey, darling, the bandage is gone from your face. What a lovely surprise to see me. And he says, yes, Gilda, surprise. Now look, look again. He's like yelling at his wife. He's got this really sinister look. We see him for the first time. He turns to us. Mm -hmm. um, and it's this sort of really, you know, uh, seriously messed up, like green with like scarring all across. Um, his mouth is kind of half open. It's a good design. It's a good design. It, I think so. Um, yeah. But but like green and face kind of looking like decayed skin, like mm -hmm. like traditional Frankenstein. That's that's how I took it. Uh, the hair is all messed up on one side and like clean combed on the other, which I'm assuming is a choice of his. Um, <laughs> yeah, it must be. But, I don't know. It, hur it hurts to brush it. <laughs> uh, what I really do love about this is like saying the Nolan version or um, mm -hmm. the Batman, the animated series version is there is some sort of underlying darkness to, to Harvey before he gets mm -hmm. scarred here. He seems fine. And then it's just society hates you now. Yeah, no, he, he kind of assumes that his wife is, is not going to be cool with it. Um, and in fact, she's fiance, not. she is still Sorry, fiance. fiance in this Gilda, yeah. that, that's right. Um, is she <clears throat> named in this issue? She is. Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know if she's named in these panels, but they do call her Gilda in the, in the okay. issue. That, sure. that, that does remain consistent. Yeah. Yes. But like, to, to be honest with you, I can't 
really blame her because he doesn't try to <laughs> like give it to her easy. He's not like, sit down. This is complicated. You know, let's talk about it. He doesn't like, he's just like, look at me. And he like lunges at her and he's grabbing at her. It's like, I would imagine that would be pretty traumatic. He's, he's yeah. upset. And he, he pulls out hammers and he starts, <laughs> I mean, she's an artist who sculpts right, She's a him. sculptor. Yes. Right. She loves beauty. Yeah. <laughs> and he jumps on on the statues of himself and starts beating the side of of the statue that um, is scarred on himself. That's uh, really funny. For whatever reason, in my head, um, I had like shorthanded this, like I don't know, inattentional blindness. This such that one of his hands was holding a chisel and the other was holding a hammer. So like he was like hammering on the sculpture to no. destroy it. No. Double <laughs> hammers. Dual baby. wielding hammers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Popeye hammers. Like, wooden. <laughs> you know, oh, like I was doing the, the, the Mario thing. Yes. It looks like that too. Yeah. It's so weird. He's not even yeah. like defacing it. He's just utterly getting rid of the other side of the face. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, it looks like it's going to fall over. So he's probably like, yeah, destroying it. Yeah. He's wailing on it. So yeah, we cut to later that night and he's monologuing. He's talking to himself. He's sort of disgusted with the way he looks. He's mad at the silver dollar, which by the way, comically large. Like, I don't know if you yeah. noticed. You, you need to be able to notice what it lands on. I guess that's fair. <laughs> but he's like holding it between <laughs> his like, weapon. Hand, uh, uh, finger, uh, forefinger and his thumb. And it's like the size of his fist. Like it's huge. Yeah. It's the size of his palm, essentially. Yeah, yeah. It's huge. And he's mad at, at the coin. He says, you caused all my trouble. You know, Maroney's lucky to headed silver dollar. And he decides to scratch one of the sides. Two sides. Handsome like mine. Yes, thank you. How about you just read that whole thing? Two sides. Handsome like mine once was. Now one is scarred. Ugly like mine. And then he chucks it through. What, that no, he doesn't chuck it. So he, this is what's confusing to me. In his left hand, he still has the coin. He chucks something else. Looks like a beaker, maybe. Oh, weird. Okay. Yeah. Oh, whatever. Oh, I guess I don't know. Maybe it, that is the coin, but then what's that circle behind it? I, I thought he broke a window and that's the that's like the moon, but no, he was it's looking a mirror. in a mirror. Okay. A... I assumed it was a window in the moon. <laughs> Wait, it's it's the not it's the not great guild uh uh, golden age art yeah exactly I'm, yeah. I'm certain it's the mirror because he was just looking at the mirror before and there's a bit later in this issue where he gets mad at one of his goons for not destroying a mirror he makes mm. a big deal about mm. not having any mirrors in his hideout um, i blame no wonder he loses to batman all the time <laughs> he's just he's just causing more and more uh bad luck oh yeah there you go <laughs> <laughs> i thought you were gonna say something like he can never see batman come up behind him or something <laughs> No one sees Batman uh, come up behind him or he's doing a bad job. If they had mirrors, maybe they would. <laughs> anyway, uh, he said, you know, wouldn't take much to make me one of the criminals now. A trick of the fate, perhaps. A flip of a coin. And why not? With the very coin responsible for my trouble. If the good side wins, I'll t wait till Dr. Eckhart is free. Uh, the s scarred side and I enter a life of crime. I think this is interesting. You pointed out, Jameson, that. Batman seems super not worried. Like, oh, obviously, Dr. Eckhart's going to get out eventually. Harvey Kent also assuming that, that Dr. Eckhart's going to get out of the concentration camp. Uh, I can tell you, he does not show up in the next part. <laughs> I don't think he's mentioned. Yeah. We haven't covered World War II at all um, in on the podcast yet, but I'm sure we will. Yeah, these, these haven't really touched World War II yet. Well, that's the thing, is that this, this is just happening. So this is... Um, this issue is, I think, is June 1942. It's middle of the year. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we enter the war December 1941. The, the sort of United States, if you allow a tangent for me for just a moment about history, the United States, yeah. um, through the free press, we're getting all kinds of information about uh, Germany, um, the anti-Semitism treatment of Jews, even the concentration camps. Um, you know, all of that news is coming throughout the 30s um, in, into the early 40s after we joined the war. Um, at this time, summer of 1942, there has been free press, like public, uh, you know, journalism that's been done that has conveyed to the public that it's it's likely that there are millions of Jews who have died already at this point in the war. But the United States government hasn't hasn't acknowledged that um, they don't acknowledge the fact or confirm or corroborate that there are two million dead Jews until the end of 1942. So it may be the mm. case that the writers are sort of in the state of mind where we're not sure what what's happening. Like we have a sense that something's happening, but we don't really have a full picture of the Holocaust. So sorry for that dour note, but like that might be why they're writing it this way at that time. Yeah. Mm. And a lot of them are Jewish immigrants. 
all of them. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah. We, we haven't talked about this, but everyone in Bob Kane's shop, they're all second generation. So they, they are yeah. all native born Americans, but they are all Jewish. Yeah. Children of immigrants. Um, mm-hmm. Superman at this time, I'm pretty sure has. They do a few times not naming the Nazis, but Nazi mm. adjacent. Yeah. Um, Hitler does eventually show up and he got yes. possessed by a thing that was like a gremlin. Mm. Uh, and then there was the recurring uh, terrorist group, the the fourth column. The fourth that column. Was met, yes, they were. Uh, they were an unnamed European power, friendly, who were preparing for the invasion here. Interesting. They just kind of disappear once World War II really kicks off and then mm. ends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do get a lot more. I know I know for a fact you get a lot more um, things about World War II and the Nazis and Superman than you do in yes. Batman. But it does happen in okay. Batman as well. Um, so we'll, I'm sure we'll have an episode where we go a little bit deeper on, on World War II because we have to, to, to cover some of that. Yeah. And, and once again, where we should plug that, um, episode that we keep talking about, but never doing. <laughs> yes. The, which is the, the Batman serials. It's coming someday. We're going to do an episode about the serials. Resetting the context here, coming back to where we were. So he's got the coin. He's wondering like, oh man, do I wait for Dr. Eckhart and get the plastic surgery eventually? Or do I have a life of crime? Let's let the coin decide. What drives him to this moment, I don't know. Like, we just get the sense that he's a madman, right? He's monologuing. Mm-hmm. He flips the coin, and it lands on the the side that's been scratched up, and he says, crime wins. From now on, I decide everything on the flip of a coin. This is two faces that symbolize mine, beautiful and ugly, good and bad. Hee-hee. <laughs> <laughs> I love the hee-hee. Yeah, the the way they say that that kind of stuff, it's it's probably really common at the time, but now it falls funny on my ears. But the <laughs> they do a lot of those hees and the ho hums and stuff like that. It's pretty funny. So yeah, then we kind of get like a little uh, splash, or I guess like a double wide panel of uh, you know mm-hmm. Two Face standing there looking kind of mean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we cut to one month later, and he's in his new hideout. He's made a made a hideout. I don't know if you want to describe that, Brian. Oh, I would love to. Um, be, this I was actually just thinking this. Uh, reading this comic gave me so much greater appreciation for um, Batman Forever, which I already <laughs> love. Yeah, but like all the Two Face stuff, they just nail right on the head. Like yeah. they're using all the stuff from the they they've got the origin scene mm-hmm. where he's got acid splashed on the face. He's got the coin with the scratches on it. Mm-hmm. It's not like burnt on one side, like in the Dark Knight. It's just got those dagger scratches in it. Yeah. Exactly like the comic. And then they've got his office here, which is just like his lair in uh, Batman Forever, where one yes. side is like pristine and normal and the other side is all dark and, and messed up. So he's sitting there at his desk facing on at the camera or the viewer or whatever. <laughs> and on the left side, it is like a totally normal, like lawyer office. Mm-hmm. There's uh, a couch, bright, lamp. bright colors. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side, it's like everything is covered in concrete or burned. It's just <laughs> brutalist architecture. Um, and it's cracks and, and it's scarred just like he is. Um, so, but, but it's like, it lines up with his face and his, his um, uh, suit and his desk and the walls and everything. Yeah. Right Here's the, the question. Mm-hmm. Does he always have to stand like this? Because the theme <laughs> is lost if he turns around. Oh, sure. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's got to have great posture, too, because if he just like tilts off to one side a little bit. <laughs> it doesn't align with his chair anymore. That's a good yeah, I a always good wonder... Same thing with Batman, but I wonder with all these characters who do like some serious interior design... Did they do it themselves or did they hire it out? <laughs> yeah, it's true. He's not like a crime boss in this, right? We don't see him have any goons, right? He's kind of like a rogue agent. So does he have mm-hmm. people that work for him? We don't say. Not at, not at this point, yeah. yeah. And then we have a montage. Like the rest of this page is him flipping the coin, doing good things. He flips the coin, he does bad things. He robs a bank. He gives money to an orphanage. We jump through a bunch of different people. It's such a good but, idea of yeah. I do I, a good I thing it, or yeah. a bad thing. And then there's the debate you were getting to over, like, mm-hmm, is mm-hmm. uh, Two-Face good or bad? And I love this idea that they don't really continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I totally agree. This is where I think Batman Forever didn't do it right. Yeah. Because Two-Face is, in Batman Forever is just, like, bad. And it's either you die or you get let go. Sure. Or Whereas... he, there, there's the scene where he won't stop flipping the coin until he gets mm-hmm. the, 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 the side he wants. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so uh, in in this version, I love this idea. It really shows the duality that like on one side, he's still like a DA. He's he's like the the white knight or whatever. And on the other side, he's a, a crime lord. He's a he's a mobster or whatever. And so it's it's not he does a bad thing or he doesn't do a bad thing. It's he does a bad thing or he does a good thing. Mm -hmm. So he's robbing banks or he's like stealing from people. He's killing people, whatever. But he also he na he snatches a rival gangster's loot and gives it to a charity home. Yeah. Okay, it's he charity. said, "Here, buy the kids some new clothes." Like I love the I mean that is like the pendulum swinging for real and I really like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that idea. And we see this little survey of like different figures, you know, there's a police officer, there's this businessman, there's an old lady and they all have different opinions. You know, Two-Face is a murderer, he looted my jewelry shop. Uh he's a philanthropist, he paid off my mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. Um so they're really driving it home. Oh, he does have goons. I, I didn't see that. Yes, he definitely has goons in this issue. Yeah, he, sorry. He, he, there's he going to be the us. rob. Yeah, he gets uh, goons. I, it's just I thought I was misremembered. No, no, we, yeah, we don't see any goons yet. He has to have had goons, though. Yeah, he does. De he definitely does get goons. I don't know how you get goons really quickly. <laughs> I, I don't Money. know either. Yeah, I guess you pay them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we cut to later and the, the goons are asking him, he says, but boss, why do you flip the coin before we pull each job? And he says, the coins, two faces symbolize my two sides, good or evil on them depends our next move. Watch. And he flips the coin and he says, the ugly side wins. Evil triumphs over good. Ha ha. Our next job will be the Brown bond company messenger. So we have, um, you know, like, you know, today you would have like an armored car when you need to move money from a bank, right? Mm -hmm. This is, mm -hmm. this is the courier who's picking up, dropping off money. Uh, and apparently he rides a public bus. <laughs> and so they oh know gosh. that this this uh, this bank guy is going to be moving money on the bus at this particular day at this particular time. And so they go to the bus depot and they hijack the bus so that they're the ones driving it. And they're already on when he gets on. It's like a double decker bus, too. It's, it is a yeah, double decker. Is. This is the first instance of the twos. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, he's got the obsession with twos. I didn't think yes. that this was that, but totally. It's another thing that will eventually go away. That one takes longer. Um, it's well, it's it's a little silly if you think about it. It's probably we're talking about like, oh yeah, it's cool that there's the dichotomy. There's the people who like think it's you know he's a good guy. There's the people who think he's the bad guy. We, we like the you know the symmetry and the art, the symbolism. Right? This is a little stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm really into twos. You see? <laughs> yeah. Um, because of my name, get it? Yeah, I get it. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> the the bank guy gets on the bus and um one of the goons is dressed up like a, a you know a worker he comes up and gets the fa uh, asks for the fare um batman and robin just so happen to be on a nearby rooftop and they see them shaking down this bank guy uh which is interesting because we don't see it <laughs> no we do not we um, do not and 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 it's not here in this issue but batman and robin being on a nearby rooftop and seeing someone get beat up is almost the default. Yes, right. Yeah. Opening they get of a so Batman lucky. Golden Age story. Yeah. yeah, they're on patrol constantly, um, <laughs> surveying the land, um, and they jump down from this building and they swing off um, a, a lamp post onto the mm -hmm. onto the bus and they just start fighting the goons. And and <laughs> Two Face is like, but thank goodness it's a double decker bus though. It's like an open roof, or they wouldn't have seen anything. <laughs> it's true. Uh, they wouldn't have been able to just jump in and start fighting. And <laughs> I'm sure that bus is fine. <laughs> There's not much to say, I guess. They start fighting. It, it's the problem with a lot of Golden Age stories. Uh, Batman's a little bit better of allowing action to kind of happen. Mm. But a lot of Golden Age Superman stories are him running back and forth between like three different things. And then he doesn't really do much. Mm hmm. And I'm like a big lover of Superman. I don't think he's boring. But I think the way they're presenting action in Golden Age Superman is pretty boring. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is pretty dynamic. You know, they, they jump onto the bus. They're throwing punches. Um, mm -hmm. There's a there's a stair set of stairs on the back of the bus. And like Robin kind of uses the stairs as a chance to like kick, kick goons down it. Um, it's dynamic i i will say if i hadn't looked over this issue again i mm. probably would have not remembered this part at all it yeah there, there's there's really nothing of consequence happens uh batman kind of gets knocked out um and the 
the goon who's driving the bus realizes that Babo and Robin are here and he nopes out. He's like, I'm going to crash this bus. See ya. Robin is um, working his way to the front of the bus after getting hit and um, is able to pull the brake just in time. Before it drives into a building. That's right. Yeah. We cut to later. Uh, you know, Batman and Robin have foiled Two-Face's crime. He's gotten away somehow. Uh, and he's back at his, his uh, lair. Which is much larger. <laughs> and still split right down the middle Indeed. with craziness and chaos on one side and like pristine polish on the other. Mm-hmm. I have to run to the middle of it immediately. <laughs> he is in yeah. the middle again. <laughs> yeah. Batman can't find me anywhere else. <laughs> Perfectly split <laughs> down the middle. It's his camouflage. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a zebra. <laughs> yeah. He won't see me if I'm here. Um, <clears throat> he's looking at himself in a mirror and he says, can this be me? And then he realizes that there's a mirror and he's upset. And he says, I gave orders not to have any mirrors in my house. Who put this mirror up? And uh, one that's of a his... good question. Where did the mirror come from then? <laughs> well, he talks to one of his goons. He says, oh, you know, I forgot it, boss. I'm sorry. It was an accident. Um, and how do you accidentally put up a mirror? I think he forgot to take it down. I, I really know. I really felt like there needed to be a mirror in this layer. <laughs> and <laughs> I forgot the rule number one. No mirrors. The yeah. interior designer said it needs a mirror in here, and he wasn't paying attention. You have to have an <laughs> interior designer. It goes without saying, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> I was walking through, and I tripped over the line in the middle, and the mirror <laughs> in my pocket flipped out <laughs> and hung on the wall. I'm sorry. Batman <laughs> broke in earlier and put in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> Two-Face flips a coin uh, to decide the fate of the goon who screwed up and left the mirror. Um, it's the evil side. He shoots mm. shoots the goon. We see that off panel. We have the kind of silhouettes Silhouette, and the smoke, yeah. gun smoke. And then he says, we're going to pull a heist at a double, double feature next, right? So they're going to go to a movie theater. Um, now that's the real two. moment. Yes. Mm. No, it, we're going to get there in a minute, but I think it's pretty great. Batman and Robin find out about the double feature heist because um, they're looking at the goons on the bus that they, um, you know, the, the, the ones they knocked out that are still there. And <laughs> one of the goons has a piece of paper stuck to his foot. Uh, Cause he stepped in gum and it, the piece of paper just so happens oh to be a map of the double feature heist that they're about to do. We need a better class of good. <sighs> we do. There's, there's so, so much like as far as like greatest detective on earth or whatever, yeah. there's so much stuff <laughs> that he happens upon by luck. Like, yeah. There was another one that the only reason they solved it was because like a piece of paper flew off of a boat and then was flown back. Oh in yes. That was the first cat woman. Batman number one. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, just luck. But it, they're fourteen page. They're they're like fourteen page stories. They do right. not have room for anything. I mean, at least they have a reason to be there this time. Like they got a clue. They're following the clue. They're right. going to be at the next thing. It's true. It's not. I was That's standing true. on a building nearby and I happened to see it. So I constantly complain about Superman mystery stories because there's just no time to do anything. Right. Um. The first one they try is almost unreadable because of how. Often someone enters a room and it's like, hello, I am this and that. And then next page, hello, I am this and that. Just to get as many things in as possible. Mm -mm. Speaking of Superman. Yeah. Yes. Play the double feature. I will say Superman has watched Superman cartoons in a theater in in Superman. Yes. (laughs) That's awesome, and that. it was it was in fact the uh, Fleischer. It was it was the uh, oh, wow. like the yeah. first one with the giant robots, yeah. which is so much better than anything that was being put in the comic at the time. <laughs> I had growing up um, two or three episodes of the Fleischer Superman on VHS, and I thought it was I fantastic. did too. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, they sold them at like Walgreens or something like that. We just picked it up off the rack. So yeah, they're watching. They're in the movie theater. They're watching Superman. Um, it cuts fighting a lightning bolt, which uh, like once supposedly killed him in an issue. Here, here's the thing about Superman: not consistent about what does or doesn't hurt him for a while. Interesting, yeah. I so I am not very familiar with Golden Age Superman. We'll have to talk about it more here in, in a bit. But um, that's uh, it is interesting. I, I didn't read that as him fighting the the lightning bolt, but I guess it makes sense. Yeah, it's it's a job for Superman. And the movie cuts, and everyone's upset. They're like, gosh, it was just at the interesting part, too. The reel must have broken. And they, I think it's really funny. They start clapping for the, the person who's in the booth to, like, fix it. Uh, I don't know if they're slow clapping. but uh, Have you ever been in a movie theater where where the movie has broken? Yes. People yes. Are, get upset. Yes. Oh, yeah. Actually, I, it happened during the Batman for me. Really? Me, too. 
Yeah, it. Uh, uh, I I had to come back because they tried for over an hour, and it did not work. Yeah, I used to work at a movie theater, so I actually fixed some of the the breaks. Um, I've I've seen film melt in half, uh, on up on the big screen and stuff. But well, now now it's all digital, and they don't know how to work it. <laughs> yeah. I, w- I was actually there for a transition edition digital and I had to learn the systems. That's not that hard. I don't know what the no. problems are. It's it's and it's more it's more difficult than playing a movie on your computer. But like, it's not crazy. Um, but but like with this issue where there the people are clapping. I'm curious if that was like a 1940s etiquette thing where like oh. that was common because like to me, it seems strange. Like I would never I mean, clap if something bad happened like that. We clap. We clap when it comes back on. Sure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> when the plane lands. <laughs> yes. So anyway, everyone's clapping to say that the the theater's broken, and we've got like the Inglorious Bastards moment. Yes. Where new new film comes in, we've got Two Face pops up, and he he basically says, "Hi, I'm Two Face." Just so you guys know. Uh, when you go to court later on about this, <laughs> my name is Two Face. Yeah, and we got to get the uh, brand out I've there. Give... <laughs> that's right. Raise, that's what, raise that's awareness. What every good mobster does is they work <laughs> on their brand. He's got his whole like style. He wears a suit. Yeah. Um, and so then he says, "My goons are going to come around. We're going to take all your money." This, get, get this ready. seems like a bad robbery. It just it's time consuming. There, there's places that probably have more money. Sure. Well, I, I think it's really um, visually pleasing. Like he's two yeah. faces there. He's larger than life. It's very like, um, you know, 1984. It's very, uh, you know, what is it? Bill Gates behind Steve Jobs at, uh, yes. at Mac. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Big brother. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. It's just a cool set piece. We haven't really had a bunch of the sort of, um, you know, trademark Bill Finger, you know, gigantic typewriters, gigantic records, you know over the top set pieces. And I think mm-hmm. this is sort of starting to lean into that. It's something that's still plausible, but like, it's just a cool visual moment. There's a, a panel mm-hmm. here where uh, Batman is sort of intervening and he swoops in on uh, a rope over the top of the crowd. And we're seeing the top of everyone's heads. And, um, you know, there's a spotlight shining on him. Two faces is, is kind of in the background. It's just like visually very pleasing. Like, I don't know how to describe it. It just looks cool. Yeah. Yeah. Visually mm-hmm. pleasing is, is exactly right and Mm -hmm. sometimes in the golden age because especially with how short the story is they kind of have to condense things so you don't get like a lot of great visuals sometimes yeah so this issue just gives you one really good set piece Mm -hmm. uh that's that is memorable and you will remember as you continue through these issues yeah and and I, I so when I first read this, I got to the point where they swapped out the film. And as a like former projectionist at a movie yeah. theater, I was like, that's not how that works. <laughs> because you'd have to like pre film and bring his own film to swap in and mm-hmm. like there's setup to do that and but then Maybe they had the reels ready to go. You don't know. I think they did. Like they acknowledge <laughs> it. They said, like in the projection booth, and they're they're they've got that little conversation between the goons and Robin jumps in, and so I was like, okay, maybe they actually do know what they t- they're talking about. And the the second thought that I had is to the 1942 reader, mm-hmm. this probably hits a little differently and does for us now because theaters are like the only way that you saw movies. Mm-hmm. That's right. Whereas yes. now we can watch them at home and stuff. And so I I'd be curious to know more about uh, someone of the time, like to go back in time, get in my DeLorean and sure. go meet someone and see how they uh, like perceived the situation. Cause it might seem much more like normal and reasonable and, and yeah, that they're always packed. So we yes. will get a lot of money. Like it makes sense. Whereas now yes. it's like you go to the theaters and they're often not full, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's just a con- uh, consistent reel. The movies just keep going. You walk in whenever. Right. It's right. The Nickelodeons, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I don't think it's a Nickelodeon technically. This is no. more like the matinee where like you'd have mm-hmm. like you'd have a cereal, yes. then you have a cereal, then you have a newsreel, then you have a movie, then, you know, they're just kind of going. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. I, I get those. I kind of combine those in my head. No, the Nickelodeon's the one that you, it's like that would be like on the boardwalk. Right. And you go yes. and you pay right. five cents. and You watch. You look into it. R- right. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, I I um I think at some point when I was young, I learned it incorrectly and it's really stuck and I can't get it to let loose. No worries. But I think you pay like a nickel and you sit for however long you feel like in a theater. No, no, no. I mean not, you that's not right. You you still pay not as much as you pay now, right, but yeah. with inflation. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> uh I did try to keep up with inflation numbers whenever like Superman gets like a million dollars from right. finding a sunken. Yeah, we've done that a few times too. Treasure. Yeah, we did that with a it was a painting mm. in the last one. I think there were mm. two. Yeah, Watteaus where they were called. They were five hundred thousand dollars a piece in nineteen thirty seven dollars. It was like forty million. Mm. Turned out to be like mm. yeah, tens of millions of dollars now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, like it, it, visually very interesting, but actually not a lot to comment about in the story wise. They fight. You know, they fight. They're yeah in front of the screen casting shadows i do this daily with golden age stories and just sometimes it is just legitimately yep just fight. just me me a summary because there's not more to say there's not yeah no not really two-face gets away he runs out into traffic mm-hmm. he hijacks a car um a cop shoots the tire on the car he crashes into a post um he runs away Two-Face on foot. runs away yeah yeah batman follows two-face to his hideout and maybe we can't really tell if that's a split <laughs> <laughs> it's true this is the first time we cut to the hideout and two-face isn't standing perfectly in the center <laughs> you know with his desk that's why him. batman could see him <laughs> yeah, that's right yeah the uh not camouflage this time basically you know they have a conversation batman explains to him that the only reason the cop shot his tire is because not because he was chasing him from the theater but because he was driving t- the wrong way down a one-way street so i don't know if that's relevant like That'll teach you for being hasty. Like you should be calmer when you run away. We're 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 aware that the story needs to get to a climax. We just <laughs> whatever get get him to can be confronted. He's not getting away this time. No, they're just they're just filling panels uh, <laughs> at this yeah. point. Two Face draws a gun and he's gonna shoot Batman. He's sticking him up and he says, "But I've got to flip the coin first, right?" And he flips the coin and it perfectly lands on its side and i believe it's implied that this is in the center of his room so it's it's literally landed on the seam between the green side and the gray side <laughs> and so i don't know if there's wow. like a, the wood and the carpet are matching up or maybe i'm reading too yeah, much you're into right. it no i think you're dead right <laughs> it, like when i look at the the first panel where it ca- gets caught i was like oh the uh, the cracks in the board but where Batman and Two Face are both looking at it, there's clearly like different two colors. different colors of floor. Yes, <laughs> I I can't remember because we get a better shot of the room uh, in the next issue. In the next issue, and I do not remember it very well. In my head canon, it's for sure caught in the middle. There's a seam. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Green carpet on one side, you know, burnt ash, <laughs> you know, wood <laughs> on the other. It's perfectly in the middle, um, and that's how they cliffhanger us is. Uh, is is Two Face going to shoot Batman? We don't know because the coin didn't didn't land. It's on its side, and you will find out. <laughs> Not next month. It is the issue after next. We got to yes. do a Penguin issue. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, James. This is a three parter. I believe the first uh, Two Face. Oh, I haven't gotten to game. that yet. Yeah. Right. Oh, I'm gonna. <laughs> oh. You're gonna be upset if I spoil it for you. I have notes. We're gonna talk about it. I know where Two Face is now. <laughs> okay. <You can't> sp- <laughs> Fair enough. And that that's Detective 66. Do you guys have any thoughts about this story? How do you feel about it? Well, I like it more than most Golden mm. Age stories. Uh, I get criticized a lot for being down on too it. Too hard. Yeah. Because yeah. A, it's easier to talk about that stuff. But B, these stories are written to be essentially thrown away. It's true. Yeah. And they, they, they weren't uh, intended to last the test of time. They were written for children. No. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. They there's nothing yeah. deep. This one feels like it has a little bit more going on. I it's agree. not it's not a lot, but I'll take what I can get. Yeah, it's only 14 pages, but like the first two are the origin story, which is elemental and correct and like nail on the mm-hmm. head. Mm-hmm. It has mm-hmm. it some... stays. It works so well it stays. Indeed. Yes. Uh, and we've got like character development. Like we we have the idea that like he does good things. And he does bad things, and there's like a, a sort of a wild card element where you don't know what to expect. A lot of the Bill Finger goons are pretty one dimensional and boring. They do bad stuff. They get caught. They end die at the end of the issue. Right. This is more of like, not just I you know 
dressed like a penguin. I'm a fat guy, <laughs> you, you know, with an umbrella. <laughs> I have an umbrella. Yeah. Oh. It's like I have a, a way that I operate. I have a modus operandi, right? And that's really cool. Mm-hmm. And then we have that really cool set piece in the theater. It's just like two or yeah. two and a half pages of that action sequence where like the art for the first time for me, really, in the golden age, I'm going like, this is cool. Like, not just like, oh yeah, I can mm. understand that the anatomy is well, or like that design. It's like, that's, it's cool. Like that is a, a set piece you could do in a modern comic and it could work. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I agree. In a modern comic, we would be able to tell if that, if that coin landed right it's in the middle of the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. The, the, it, it, there is some dumb stuff too. The, this, the oh, double yeah. decker set piece is dumb. <laughs> the coin landing on its side so we can have a cliffhanger also dumb, but you know, which, if you know how the next issue begins is really ridiculous that this is how they ended it. How does it, how does it begin? I don't recall. I did read it, he, but he picks up the coin, puts it in his pocket, is talking to Batman and a police officer walks in and shoots him. <laughs> and the bullet, the bullet stops the coin. Oh, it gets at the coin. That's oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And I had to reread that because like afterwards he has this epiphany that he's just going to be two faced. But when I was reading it the first time, it read kind of like, Oh, uh, I'm going to be good or evil all the time now. Yeah, yeah because yeah. it hit that side. That's really funny. Wow, Brian, any thoughts? Uh, this is, I mean, as far as the Golden Age stuff we've read, this one's pretty good. I I like kind of goofing and and making fun of the stuff, but from the from the Golden Age stuff we've seen, I agree. This is a, this is a pretty good pretty one. Good. It's it's got some of the like goofy um, storyline stuff. The the art can be silly at times. The storyline can be a little ham fisted or whatever, but. Um, I this I think this is an origin that uh, it's it's gonna stick, as we know, um, and it's it's pretty memorable. Yeah, it it definitely it just like for viewers if you're not reading like a golden age story after golden age story, just how much when something of quality mm. uh, appears every so often it just it floors you. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. We're we're doing more of a survey approach than you are. Uh, we'll talk about mm-hmm. your show here in just a minute. But, uh, y- you know, we, we've been lucky that we've been able to pluck some of the good stuff, but even some of the notable issues, right? We're, we want to talk about the first Penguin. We want to talk about the first Clayface. When you go and you what? say, like, where did this all begin? And it's it's bad. Like, that's really disappointing. <laughs> like, you're like, oh, man. Golden Age, especially those first couple issues, especially in Superman, there would be like one panel and then you would have like a description saying like three or four things happened. Mm. They did not know how to pace. Yeah. They still don't know how to pace the story, but they it's really true. did not know how to pace the story. Yeah, no, it, it, it definitely uh, feels a lot of times like they're, they're trying to give you a lot. And so it's like set piece, set piece, set piece without like character development or whatever, which or, is the know. problem with the next two face issue sure. where, yeah. where it feels like eight different stories start up every other page yeah so that, that's a good segue um they do strike while the iron's hot so you get three um two-face issues in a row here um but interestingly well not really in a row we get that penguin it, it's true there, there's a few other ones in between but like um within a few months of each other and they're, they're they go together like they're all continuations of each other and for me i covered batman 13 and the three mm. stories in that each one a different week mm-hmm uh, so it felt like forever between sure, those yeah. two stories. Yeah, yeah. No, that that makes sense. But Two-Face only appears in the Golden Age seven total times. So there are seven mm. issues containing Two-Face, which is a lot less than other ones we've covered. So Penguin, 34 mm-hmm. times, Catwoman, 16, Joker, 62. Do you know what number recurring villain, if we're counting uh, recurring villains, he mm. is? So for us, he's like the fourth we've covered, I think, or fifth. Um, so we're still early in terms of retur- recurring mm. villains, but... Yeah. We we got there's Hugo Strange, there's Doctor Death, yeah, Penguin, Clayface, Catwoman, Joker. 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 I think that's it. Yeah, so he so he's possibly the sixth. Yeah, really soon here. Oh no no no! Uh, Scarecrow happened in December of 42. oh that's right that was the first one or forty one Scarecrow Scarecrow December mm. forty one I think he's it, that's in World's Finest uh, number three. So yeah, the reason that he only appears in the Golden Age seven times, I, I think, is not because he's a successful character. I think people really did like him, or at least I, that's the vibe I get. It's that at the end of this first three issue arc, they give him a happy ending, right? So he actually decides that he's going to be good. Oh. He ends up back with Gilda. Sorry, I'm sorry for spoiling it for you. It uh, that sounds like an amazing story. It's great, but <laughs> what it means is that they're reluctant to have him to return to crime. So how do you do 
Two Face stories if you've redeemed him? And the answer is that we have like stand ins. So in future Golden Age oh. issues, there are Two Faces that are copycats. They're not actually Harvey Dent. Um, so Harvey Kent. Well, so he he will become oh, Harvey Dent how, how eventually. Yes. I don't know. It, I, I think yeah. in a, a couple of years. It's not long. So yeah, that, that's the gist. That's why he's only appeared seven times is because they kind of didn't know what to do with him. They didn't want to make him evil again, um, which obviously eventually happens. But um, I kind of stand with it. I wish they would have they would have stuck with it. It's hard when you do, when you're doing something for yes. eighty years, right? But I um, my biggest hot take, yeah, is I think a lot of runs would be stronger if we just accepted that they were their own continuity. Oh sure, yeah, that's probably fair. Um, yeah, I mean, I love it. But like right now in Batman, Alfred's dead. So right. just have him alive. We don't have to explain how he comes back. See, that's the thing, right? Is that if you accept that this is a capsule, right? That 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 like this continuity is its own thing. You you would mm-hmm. think that like it would let people be a little bit more at peace for having it be its own. You can always go back. We're going to do another thing, right? But what happens is that that continuity doesn't match the one that they like, right? So like New 52, no, no. you've got zero yeah. year. Uh, everyone gets really upset. They're like, that's not my Batman. And then all of a sudden they're having to, <laughs> they're having to reboot, right? Anyway. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the inspirations for Two-Face. We always try to go back and get quotes from all the people who were in the room. Unfortunately, that doesn't really exist for Two-Face. So, so a lot of times Ooh. we can get Jerry Robinson or Shelley Moldoff or... Robinson know. was very vocal near the... Yeah, for, for like especially after Kane died, it's true. He well, and he made it to the internet age. So there are yes. lots of like YouTube videos and podcasts where he's on the record, and he put out books right um, where right. he w- was interviewed a lot. And he does say things about Two Face. We had a quote on the Penguin episode where he brings up Two Face as like one of the reasons Batman had early success. And he does have quotes that I was able to find where he said, "I worked on you know the first appearance of it," but he doesn't say anything beyond that. Like it was interesting, mm. and I and I worked on it. So the only quote. I have here are from Bill Finger. Not sorry, not Bill Finger. Bob Kane. Not no, we did not. Um, yeah, like right only, before he died, people started finding out who he right. was at conventions. There's only three Bill Finger interviews that are known um, that Ooh. that survive. Yeah, and so Two Face doesn't talk about him. The first quote I have is from Creators of the Superheroes, which is the Tom Andre book. Tom Andre, the ghostwriter for um, Bob Kane's autobiography. Brian, do you want to read this quote from Bob Kane? Sure. Uh, I created Two-Face. He was he was based on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, who combined good and evil in one person. I saw the Frederick March movie when I was a kid. Two-Face was inspired by that. I hadn't read the book. In collaboration with Bill Finger, I came up with the idea of his flipping the coin to see whether he would be good or evil. You can't trust any of that. <laughs> no, you know, I know. You can't you can't yeah. really trust Bob, Bob Kane. It's true, but to me this is kind of believable because um we have a corroborating quote. This one is oh. unattributed. Unfortunately, like Les Daniels does this a lot um, in the complete Batman, the complete history. He'll talk about, you know, I haven't gotten around to reading that yet. It's a good one, but, but Les Daniels is not great about citations. He doesn't says who said okay, it or okay. when it was said. I mean, but... I'm bad at that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it probably is repeating something that Bob Kane said, but, here, here's what, I'll say, what he says. He says, Two-Face was Bob Kane's brainchild exclusively. The obvious inspiration came from Robert Louis Stevenson's 1886 tale, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and Kane specifically credited the 1932 film version, which won an Academy Award for actor Frederick March. He may have also uh, noticed publicity for the 1941 remake starring Spencer Tracy, featuring a symbolic image of a face divided into uh, good and evil halves. And so here and that's poster. we have the poster. Yeah. And it looks like Clayface to me. Uh, I don't know. Brian, do you want to describe it? Two-Face. Sorry. Not Clayface. Two-Face. Two-Face. Yeah. As soon as I start hearing inspired by a movie. Yeah. I immediately think Bill Finger because Bill Finger was always so, um, apparently at the silent, especially the, the international ones. Yeah. Um, a lot. I, I will say that I believe more. Um, that Bob did, you know, was in, inspired by movies than he was by books. Like we, we don't have mm-hmm, any evidence mm-hmm. that Bob was an avid reader. We know that Bill was. Well, right? I meant so, Bill. Bill was the big movie guy. Yeah, I understand. Um, yeah. But like, there, there are times when Bob's on the record saying like, I was inspired by Zorro, right? And that doesn't make any sense, right? Because right. we, we know he wasn't a big reader, right? And so that's probably yeah. Bill who's being inspired by Zorro, right? I mean, if you've read Grant Morrison, how Grant Morrison puts the creation mm. of Batman in their uh, 
autobiography history, just talking about how much all of this is ripped off from something and how it oh, totally. just didn't feel creative. Yeah. We're going to hang tight. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Um, I'm impatient. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Uh, <laughs> you know, who, who knows? Like, I don't want to say that it was yeah. definitely Bob, but I will say that like, they were on the nose. Like, it's not like they tried to hide it. The title page was Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, the book. Mm -hmm. It did have a picture that looks like this poster. So whether it was Just Bob's like idea it. or not, th the fact that it was inspired by Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, and maybe this, this movie rings true to me. Like whoever was inspired. The face this feels is right. reversed here. It's true. <laughs> the yeah, left it's... side is kind of Frankenstein. Yeah. So, so the, the, What's his name? Kent from uh, the D.A. Kent, who mm -hmm. got acid on his face, was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I don't know who the heck was in the rest of that comic book issue <laughs> because hey, the faces are backwards. <laughs> there you go. The scars on the wrong side. He, he was never really scarred. It's all a prank show. And they just <laughs> see if he's going to notice. They just apply the makeup while he's sleeping. There you go. <laughs> um, so you alluded to it a second ago. Like there's a lot of and we, we do this on a lot of episodes. There's yeah. a lot of rumors about what they ripped off. Everyone thinks like that a given story or a given character is a total ripoff. It's all plagiarism. Like Bob Kane, mm -hmm. Bill Finger didn't have an original, you know, thought in their head. Um, we mm -hmm. talked about it with Penguin. We talked about it um, with Batman itself. We've talked about it on numerous occasions. And and uh, Two Face, n no stranger, <laughs> not an exception to this rule. Uh, we might as well make it a segment on the show. Plagiarism corner. Woo the shadow. <laughs> yes. So there's a there's a few different claims out there that are floating. Jim Stranko wrote a book, History of Comics. Um, mm -hmm. It's widely considered to be very trustworthy. I, I like the book a lot because he, he does mm -hmm. get direct quotes. He's one of the people, one of the three interviews that we have with Bill Finger. Um, but he often sort of states things as fact. And skates past them because he moves very quickly in this book. He will he will just go, 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 go. And it's not like there's chapter breaks. It's not like there's... I believe that from Stranko. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that he says briefly and just goes, goes right past is, quote, Two-Face was obviously inspired by a 1938 issue of The Shadow, which featured Face of Doom, a highly similar tale. The simultaneous Jekyll and Hyde was also the blueprint for Dick Tracy villain Splitface. So... Um, and th that's the case where, like, literally two sentences juxtaposed. Like, one, he's talking about the shadow story. The next one, he's talking about Dick Tracy Dick is an Tracy. example of how he's just going, right? So, split face, the Dick Tracy uh, character definitely comes later. First appearance is in 1945. Two faces in 1942. So that, potentially, split face is an insp inspired by two face, but not the other way around. I dug in on this shadow story. It's called Face of Doom. Um it was a full shadow issue. So like in the past, we've covered backup stories that came out of um, pulp magazines um, mm -hmm. that took me like, you know, 45 minutes to read. This is like <laughs> a small novel. Like it took me like six hours to oh, read this. Wow. I, I <laughs> wish I could have that time back. <laughs> um, uh, I bet it's it's not good. <laughs> you know, it has its moments. I would say, honestly, the first like third of the book is pretty good, like mm. paced well. And then they have like three third acts. Like they, they basically don't have any more story to tell, but like they need pages to fill. And so it's just like oh, gosh. action sequence after action sequence of like false ending. Um, and so that's pretty rough, Oof. but you know, there's some cool ideas in it. They're getting paid by the page. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. They were, I personally don't think that this story has much to do with two face at all. The, the character in question is uh, a, a, a mob boss, right? He's at the head of like the crime in the city. He's ascended very quickly. And his whole shtick, right, is that he's very, very curated and manicured in the ways that he interacts with anyone. So he has, he sets up suddenly these, um, they're, they're more like ambushes. He doesn't appear, right? Like what happens is, um, you know, uh, a goon or uh, a, a crime leader, right, of a, of a different crime group will show up expecting to have a meeting with someone. And instead, when they walk into the room, it's very, very dark, almost pitch black. And there's these green light bulbs, right? And so there's this mysterious green light and he's got what they call luminous paint on his face, right? And so uh, it's glowing somehow. I don't know if it's like UV reactive or if it's radioactive okay. or what, but it's glowing, right? And his sort of 
eyes are, you know, sunken in. And so it's like, all you can see is the beady sort of eyes and, you know, sort of black sockets around it. And then there's like very straight lines for his jaw and a uh, line on, on his nose. And the, there's like an inverted smile on his face so that when he smiles, it's like folded down and it kind of looks weird. If you look at the the picture here um, in the, in the notes, um, the, the green half of the face is the way it's described. Um, but here's the deal. It is just paint and it is his whole full face. It is not split down the middle. Right. So later in the book, when we realize his true identity, he's a normal looking dude. Uh, and th it's all an act. He puts on makeup. He has these lights to like scare the goons to like get people on his side. He like has these appearances to like freak people out, but he, he's not, there's no twos, <laughs> right? There's no coin flipping. There's no randomness. There's no split face. He's just, just a crime boss that like ambushes his people with these like, ap you know, moments where he's in dark and his face glows and he's got beady eyes. I think it comes down to Jim Stranko thinking that this cover looks like Two-Face because if you look yeah. at the cover of the pulp. I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't take Stranko as like the best historical uh, <laughs> uh, memory. Uh, sure. Especially when it comes to like Bill, uh, not Bill Finger, uh, Mm. Like his story about nearly threatening to punch uh, uh, yeah. Kane at a convention. Great assault on that for sure. I've heard that yeah. one. Yeah, history of comics is really well regarded because of the direct quotes and the people we know mm -hmm. he talked to. Um, mm -hmm. But this anecdotal sort of thing, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily buy it. Have either of you guys heard of the Black Bat? Nope. Um, I believe so. Okay, this is one that that um, we elected not to talk about when we were doing the origin of Batman because we didn't have time. Like, if we had if we had gone on about this, it, there there was such a slam dunk with Partners of Peril and the Shadow Story that like we we <clears throat> spent our time talking about that where there are d direct lines to draw and you can say definitely plagiarism. Um, but it's worth noting, and there was a and there was a movie like The Bat that. Uh had a bat cave too uh that that uh -huh. had come out before um yeah the bat and the bat whispers yeah we talked yep. about that yeah we covered that yeah so th there are so many slam dunks that um we decided not to cover this one um but it is worth noting that this isn't just a two-face connection this is a bat batman connection mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. there's this guy his name is ned pines and he ran great name yeah it, why, why, why do you like that one I don't know. I just like the Pines and, <laughs> and a superhero named Ned. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, so Ned Pines ran numerous pulp magazines uh, in the 30s. He had a bunch of different companies for each one. Um, there was one like called the Th Thrilling Magazine or whatever. And, and uh, you know, he would stand new magazines up all the time, stand up new companies. Kind of hard to keep track of it all. It's not like National or DC is this banner. Building... Building up that bubble that 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 bubble that's about to uh, crash <laughs> in a few years. It's true, yeah. And he has three separate pulp characters that all get lumped under the moniker people when they talk about them of Black Bat. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about them as three separate things. But when when people often talk about history like this, they kind of just like throw it all together, like oh, you know, 30s pulps, Black Bat, you know, Batman inspiration, because um, it's. It's easy to do that with something where <clears throat> you never read the story or, you know, whatever. And, and, and you're just hitting the, the beats that, that sort of fit the narrative of, like, this, this plagiarism or whatever, right? So, mm -hmm. 1934 is the first time we have it. There's a very short-lived pulp magazine. There's, like, four issues. It's called Black Bat Detective Mysteries. And this one was from Pines Publishing. And it wasn't a superhero book. It um, predates Superman by four years, so it's before the superhero craze. And it's just Ooh. a normal detective book. There's nothing special about him. He has no gimmick. The only thing is he calls himself Black Bat. And um, that's where the name starts. Also in 1934, another Pine book. There's a four-issue run of stories about a character named, quote, The Bat. Not Black Bat, just The Bat. Um, in their magazine called Popular Detective. So this is another Pine book called Popular Detective. And take my summary here with a grain of salt, because I wasn't able to read this one. Um, I have the book on order, but it didn't get here in time. But it's about a guy who was framed for murder and works to deal with the guards uh, who are supposed to take out on his, you know, capital punishment and is able to stage his, his execution, right? And gets out instead and wears a hood and st stamps bat symbols on people's heads and is trying to get revenge, right? For the fact that he was framed for murder. Um, so he's kind of a vigilante but he's also kind of out for himself he's not like necessarily just trying to clean up crime he is called the bat he does cover his face and he stamps bat symbols on people's heads 
this is one that is like capitalized up upon because the rights are someone has the rights to this and they keep reprinting it. So you can buy mm. on Amazon a book called The Bat Strikes Again and Again, and it's a reprint of the first um, bat story uh, where they have decided, they have assigned, ascribed, <laughs> that the author of this is Johnston McCauley, who's the creator of Zorro. Um, but it's worth noting they don't know that. There's no proof that Johnston mm. McCauley wrote this. Um, they're just working back from like, well, it reads kind of like a Johnston McCauley story and he uses a lot of the same words. Like they run one of those word analysis tools on it or whatever. <laughs> And they stamp on the cover that it's inspiration for Batman by the creator of Zorro. Um, and there's even this uh, drawing, which I believe is a modern drawing <laughs> where they've put a bat symbol on the hood that this person wears. I'd say that's definitely not from that time. No. Yeah. yeah I agree. So, you know, kind of a vigilante kind of bat named does come, you know, five years before or four and a half, whatever. Um, the first issue detective 27, which is 1938. Then, in September of 1939, which is after, after the first Detective Batman. 27. Mm -hmm. Yes. Probably inspired by the success of Superman, Pine creates a new character called the Black Bat. So he has the name of the first character, right? Probably just reusing the name because they own it, right? And they make uh, a pulp series called Black Book Detective. Jeez. And oh, that sounds bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and Batman would have the Black Book. Oh, yes. The Black Case Book. Yes. Yes. Um, we haven't covered that, uh, so I don't. Brian doesn't know that one. No idea what you're talking mm -hmm. about. We're gonna, we're gonna. So I have been trying to decide if we're gonna do an episode about Zurinar or not soon, but I think we, I think we might. Yeah. Are you reading right now, Batman? <laughs> I am not. I'm behind. I read, I read um, Failsafe, the first okay. Zadarsky. I have, which I have, does deal with Zurinar. It, yeah, I know. I know that's a thing that Zadarsky is doing, but I. Um, um, yeah, have not. Uh, I'm not caught up. So yeah, the character is a cape and cowl. And if you look at the, I don't know, Brian, do you want to describe how this character looks on the cover? This is the first issue of of uh, sure. that includes the black bat. Yeah. So we've we've got a a dude um, who I don't know. He kind of looks like a a butler slash butcher because he's <laughs> all white, but he's got a, a a black bow tie and he's got these like purple rubber gloves. And he's got a knife in his hand and he's just kind of like looking over his shoulder like, what's over there? It's it's this dude who, I mean, he kind of looks like a combination of Zorro and Batman because he's mm -hmm. got like yes, the cowl definitely, without the without cowl the looks ears. like the Zorro. Yeah, mm -hmm. looks like the Zorro yeah. cowl, but he's got like a cape or something like a cape. He's wearing all black, kind yeah. of like a burglar. Um, it's even got the scalloping <laughs> on the way, the, the cape. Does. But he's got the gun, which mm -hmm. Batman only does a few times. Kill those vampires. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and the and this not Batman, Batman character is uh, holding a body up that is obviously dead with a knife sticking out of his chest. Mm -hmm. um, and this, I don't know, butler butcher guy mm -hmm. is in the act of trying to kill or stab a uh, a fair maiden who is... Uh, laying, laying, I don't know, unconscious or asleep in front of him with, uh, was that like a night, nightgown on or something nightgown, like that? Nightgown, sure, yeah. yeah. So there's, I mean, it's, it's dynamic. There's, yeah, you're, actually, he, you're he, definitely wondering what's happening next. He looks kind of like Batman. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he definitely. And, and so that's the thing. Same year, just a few months later, uh, four months later, after the first issue of, uh, of Batman, Detective Comics number 27, we have a vigilante crime fighter, Cape and Cowl, named the Black Bat, right? Appearing in pulps. And this is a big controversy, right? Both companies freak out. Um, so according to Bill Finger, um, in, uh, this is a direct quote from Stranko's History of Comics. He says, quote, there was a lawsuit almost pending. It was a weird coincidence. Apparently this character had already been written and on the drawing board. Whit Ellsworth, who was the art editor at DC at the time, Used to be a pulp writer for Better Publications, which was a pine company. So through Ellsworth's intervention, a lawsuit was averted. They had uh, they were ready to sue us, and we were ready to sue them. It was just one of those wild coincidences. So they're upset. DC's upset that there's this vigilante Batman, you know, bat themed hero, and um, Pine and and Better Publications are upset that you know there's a comic with with the Batman in it, right? And my and they got beat. Right. It, it came out first by just a few months, right? My understanding of the agreement that they had that would be Ellsworth worked out was that Better Publications agreed that their Black Bat would never appear in comics 
and National agreed that their Batman would never appear in Pulps. Um, so they basically tried to stay out of each other's way and averted a lawsuit that way. So we didn't talk about it because it happened after. Is it an inspiration? I don't know. There's better cases for other inspirations, right? Um, yes. Why are we talking about it now? How is this related to Two-Face? Here's the origin story for the Black Bat. And by the way, remember, September of 1939, the Two-Face issue is the middle of 1942. So Two-Face mm-hmm. happens much later. Here, here's, here's the origin for the Black Bat. There's a handsome district attorney, attorney named Tony Quinn who's splashed in the face with acid by a goon on the stand. It blinds him. Um, but he gets a top secret medical procedure from a famous scientist that not only restores his sight, but gives him night vision. Right. Wow. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's some parallels there for sure. Mm-hmm. We we're way over time already. I don't want to go too deep, but right. suffice to say, there's lots and lots of theorizing about, about this, about whether it's, they're ripping off the black bats inspiration for or, or origin story for two faces. There's lots of back and forth about like, supposedly, you know, better publications did a character that wasn't Black Bat, but was a lot like him and made a comic book and National was feeling a little like feisty about that. And so a few months later, they decided to do a rip. And so supposedly this is like a intercompany like drama. They're they're sniping at each other back and forth. It's it's sort of like, you know, taking swipes. But, you know, Great Assault, like there are pictures of like National Comics holiday parties and like pine is there, you know, at the table, taking a drink, you know? So who knows whether they're buddy, buddy, whether they're, you know, um, in conflict, whether this is on purpose or not, but it is a connection that I had to talk about because people say it's a thing. I would believe that being a coincidence more than, uh, those two characters looking the same in the first place. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. It, 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 I, I'm 50 50 on it. If you told me that they were definitely swiping the origin story, I would say yes. If you were saying it was just a coincidence that, you know, I, I tried to look up, um, I, you know, because this this is my way of like subverting these like plagiarism claims or whatever is like, is the, the, the acid in the courtroom thing a trope? Like, has that been done before? Is that there are other pulps or other novels or other other and I couldn't find any anything. Um, like maybe they're both drawing inspiration from something else. Mm, um, interesting. But you know, who, who knows, Brian? I don't know. Do you have an opinion on this one? Uh, no, no. I mean, I'm, I'm. There's, there's so many random coincidences that have popped up here and there all over the place that it is totally plausible to me that two creators could come up with something that's like mm-hmm. pretty similar, um, even around the same time, uh, because there aren't like a host of different mediums to do that kind of storytelling through yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, the, the various things that have happened in the, in the zeitgeist. I do think that the question you're asking is a really good one of is the acid on the face in a courtroom common? From the district attorney, yeah. Yeah, uh, and that that's pretty specific to be a yeah, trope. Yeah, it is. Espe- especially the district attorney element of it, but like mm-hmm. having... I don't know what the district attorney... We have, like, district attorneys in courtrooms show up a lot. Like, Superman goes through, over like a small amount of time, um, there was uh, election stories, like two or three about who was the new Metropolis mm-hmm. DA. Clark, I think, becomes the DA for <laughs> no, a short time. really? He... Uh, I might be... Is he a lawyer? No, I. he might have been... I'm trying to think. It might be the police commissioner, or those are two separate <laughs> stories. There, there's one where they keep killing somebody. Yeah. Um, and they go, "Well, Clark, you're it now." That's really funny. Um, yeah, but there, there are a lot of district attorney stories. Mm-hmm. Sure. Possibly around this time. Yeah. I would, I would believe the district attorney is less. The acid's the more specific part. Totally. Because, uh, like, acid throwing acid at someone is takes some thought. Yeah. In a courtroom. <laughs> yeah. How are you sneaking that in? Yeah. Uh, but but I, I would say that, like, there are a number of, like, historical, I guess, in at least in storytelling and stuff, uh, instances of acid being thrown in general. Mm. So, like, mm-hmm. taking these things and combining them, like, is it plausible that it's a coincidence? Totally. Is it plausible mm. that it's a, it's plagiarism? Totally. So, I, I, mm-hmm. I think, like, no pun intended, yeah. but the jury is out. In my opinion, <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's fair. I also, if if Ned Pine is with them all the time, I if other writers are there, the possibility of them overhearing something and then being inspired by sure. that. 
Well, they're buddy buddy. Like w- yeah. Whitney, Whitney Ellsworth worked for Dead Pines. Like, and and yeah. they're hanging out. Like, you know. So it's worth noting, Black Bat never really took off moderate success in the United States, but probably became the single most popular pulp character in Germany. Wow. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So uh, would go on to great success there. It's the um, David Hasselhoff of, of novel of Batman <laughs> things. If we can get David Hasselhoff to play the Black Bat <laughs> there you go. in a German movie, we got something. Um, today, Dynamite has the license for Black Bat. So from time to time, you'll have new Black Bat comic books from, from Dynamite. Um, they do love the pulp characters yes. at Dynamite. Yeah. Any final thoughts on Two-Face before we move on from that? Best villain so far. Uh, jo- jo- Joker Joker has some great stories, but I-, I think this has been pretty memorable. I hope that Two-Face sticks around. Oh, I have some bad news for you. No one's heard of Two-Face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding out for Three-Face. So tell me a comic, a comic, uh, or excuse me, a comic book a day. Where'd you come up with that? What's the elevator pitch? Um, tell, tell our listeners. I was bored one day <laughs> and uh, I thought, you know, I have the ability to read most Superman comics and I kind of want to make the claim I'm a Superman expert. Mm. So I decided that I was going to read a Superman comic a day and then I was going to write about it and I was going to be a blog mm-hmm. um so i started that what started getting a problem to that is a it's really hard to figure out uh when like say a action comic or a superman comic really came out uh compared to each other mm-hmm. but like action comics starts off as like a 60 page well action comics is a 60 page comic but only one superman story right uh the superman comics are four superman stories that are uh, that's 60 pages and that would take a while to do <laughs> every day. Um, and then after I want to say six months, I decided to do it as a video because I thought I'd get more people to actually watch the video. Mm-hmm. And I'm definitely way more animated on the video. Uh, at first I was still keeping up the blog, but eventually the website was having some problems mm-hmm. and I kind of gave up on the blog. I do stay about two weeks ahead. Um, I, they're, they're, they're a hobby. They don't take more than 30 minutes for me uh, to do, uh, including editing. Uh, I just really want to learn about Superman and how he changed. And I, I love the idea of being able to go, well, you see in Superman, like 40, this and that happened. The the one the the problem mm-hmm. is the changes and everything are very subtle. Like when he starts flying. Mm. It doesn't come through. There's mm-hmm. just like one issue where he's falling and then he does a spin and they go up. I'm like, oh, is he flying now? It's, right. He, oh, if you wow. look it up, other people will go like he might fly here. He was definitely flying in the radio show mm-hmm. before that. Um, but it's never like quite a big moment. Mm-hmm. And like with you guys trying to learn, um, I, I'm I'm having so much fun just with the powers they give him and then just throw out Mm -hmm. from issue to issue he could shape change twice (laughs) i've never heard of i didn't know that Uh, in a in a luther story i want to say in action 50 ish range he uh he takes his face and he crunches it and turns it into another guy's face wow and then there's a really good issue with a uh other dimension collector alien, which has a really good fight in it because there's not really good, like superhuman fights yet. Um, and like he knocks him down into a crater at one point and to escape, he, he escapes and then shape shifts his body to look like this alien never comes up. again. <laughs> never comes up again. That's fascinating. Uh, yes. Um, and it, it's really, cause you really get the, how comics sort of evolve with, with uh, Superman mm. over with Batman. Batman has some of the, the earlier, early like teething issues of Superman mm. uh, already kind of dealt with by the time it's, it's out. But I think people don't really respect Superman. And I think mm. 
like we all love Batman because especially our age group, um, mm-hmm. Batman, the animated series, we had the Tim Burton Batman coming out. We're so inundated with, with Batman. Mm. Um, and there's so much disrespect to Superman that I just really love when you get a really great Superman story. So I want, I want to be defending Superman and we're, we're coming out of like the Zack Snyder version who, if you love him, fine. He's not the Superman I like. So I wanted to look at how he evolved and how we got to now. And I hadn't read a lot of Golden Age stories. I've, I, I've, I've definitely cherry-picked a lot. So I, I'm really trying to get how we got from the man who is literally jumping across a sky holding a bound and gagged woman this is the opening of action comics number one if you've never read it yeah he is holding a bound and gagged woman across a field goes to the governor's house breaks down the governor's steel door Mm -hmm. and demands him to uh not delay to to not do the execution to end the execution before it happens (laughs) because this is the real murderer to you know truth justice it's not the american way anymore what is it it's uh (laughs) All that stuff is what they said in Superman yeah, Returns. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. It's I. I really love Superman. Yeah. So, so you said that you feel like you have the ability to um, get through all the Superman um, comics. Have you Have you done the calculation to see how long uh, no. doing it daily will take you? <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, this is a hobby. Um, it feels like it at least is over uh, a decade. And like the question is, like people will ask me, "Are you going to do Superboy?" Well, if there's more viewership, I would do Superboy. Sure. I did. I started doing Batman on Fridays to a change it up and b. Um, I wasn't writing anything on Batman, so it was really nice just to read the Batman issue and then put up my recording area and just from the top of my head do it. So have you? Um... Are, are, are you are you like synchronized? Like, are you do, are you in time in the same place in Superman and Batman? No, or, okay. no, no, because I'm covering Batman once a week and I started uh, earlier. Gotcha. Gotcha. And you're doing Batman five times a week or four times once. No, sorry. Superman. How yeah, often are four you times a week. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Unless something comes up. Once again, it's a hobby. Right. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't do it. It it, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm in. I'm in 1952 okay. uh, with Superman right now. Okay. And probably in 1942 with Batman. And how long have you been doing it? Like two years. Okay. Yeah. Nice. yeah, yeah. So you're actually making a pretty good clip. Yeah. I've, I've covered, I think today I covered uh, the second story in Superman 68. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I've wow. covered like 152 action comic stories. That's good. That's really good. Yeah. That's, that there are blur. I also did a. I will do. I do shorts on YouTube and TikTok. Uh, just a quick thing about a like a little summary or a little joke on a on a new comic that mm-hmm, has come mm-hmm. out. And I did do like the the longest video I've done is I I, I try to make an argument for. I wanna. I want the 1950s to be considered the Dark Ages <laughs> because if you. If you look at comic history, we go like Golden Age, we go Silver Age, we go Bronze Age, we go Modern. Uh, there will never be a postmodern age where w- w- historians now sort of talk about like little eras in comics. We don't really have a new age. Sure. Especially the fact that the modern age is like 1985. It's been 20 years. Mm. Uh, but the 50s are different enough. And there was... Because of the 50s in general, the conservative movement, and then in 54, the release of Seduction of the Innocent. It's creatively stagnant. Mm. And I, I honestly think that should be a Dark Ages. I think it should go Golden Age, Dark Ages, mm-hmm. uh, Silver Age. Some historians call the start of the modern age Dark Ages because comics got dark. Right. And I think that's that way too literal. Sure. That is way too literal of a of a description especially the fact that it is the start of another age yeah i well and i can tell that you're you're really um sort of invested in like the sort of arc of like where you know how comics changed why they changed Mm -hmm. how we got to you Mm -hmm. know where we are and so that i think that that speaks to like sort of your passion for like learning about the the golden age and, and that era or the 50s and 40s and uh interested to see where you where you go next 
So, so one question we always ask uh, anyone who we guest on the show is, um, what is your first Batman memory? Oh, it's probably watching uh, uh, the movie a lot as a kid. I Which one? I will tell you uh, the 89, because mm-hmm. I'm born in 88. Got it. I will tell you this. I have no memory of it. My father likes to tell this story. It's, there's some, it happens during the Rodney King riots. Mm. Um, it was, it was on television. I'm like three. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there, there's something going on, something of people are, are in the streets. Things are being broken. Mm-hmm. I apparently stood up and shouted, where's Batman? <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty solid. I mean, that's endearing. Yeah, uh, if my child did yeah, something that, like that, I'd be pretty happy. Yeah. So that's, and then of course, Batman, the animated series. So mm-hmm. we had, yeah. I mean, it was hard not to be into Batman mm. at that time. Yeah, definitely. Totally. Well, uh, Jameson, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, having me. I hope some of what I have said has made it into the recording. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I that was fun. Hey, Bat family. Help us out and drop a like on the video and tell us what we got wrong in the comments. If you want your voicemail or letter on the show, you can send it to us on our website, batlessons.com. And to keep the Batman history train going, watch this video next.